Thank you all so much for joining. I feel like this is a panel that needs no introductions. Um, Les Moonves, Peter Rice, Ted Sarandos, Reese Witherspoon, and Jeremy Zimmer. Um, a really fantastic lineup. Some um, like Peter and Les, I've had on this panel several times in this past. Some like Reese are new to this panel, and, and we're very happy to have everyone because the topic today could not be more topical. Um, and it's the, the idea for this panel is to look at the changing media landscape, and specifically for this panel, um, how important scale is to be competitive. Uh, the advantages of being smaller and more nimble, the benefits of scale as we try to navigate this fast changing um, landscape, more competition from all sides than ever. Um, so when, it's, when we talk about scale, I want to first go to Ted, because Netflix has been trying to scale. You are going to be making 50 movies a year, 78 series. Are these numbers true? It, it, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you go from 12 movies a year to, to 50? And, and what, is your, what is Netflix's vision of scaling? You've never made an acquisition of another company. Right. Do you I, need to? Um, time will tell. I think right now I've been, we're, we're, we've always been builders. Um, we, but we, and up until a few years ago, we literally had no use for non-technical IP. Uh, so we'll, we'll see as time tells over, as we grow. The, the two versions of you know, ha, how scale works for us and how um, the challenge of it going forward is you have to be, we're in 190 countries, we release all of our original shows simultaneously in multiple languages at the exact same moment all over the world. So every once in a while that happens and it's a global TV event. We do it every, sometimes every, some months we do it every day. So we have a new piece of content, either a documentary, a series, a kid's show, a movie, launching every day like that. Um, and the interesting thing is, when, can you make a show that is really relevant to the lo a local market that is then becomes a global show? There's a lot of examples of uh, American shows that travel around the world, but we produced a Portuguese language Brazilian show that travels all over the world this year too. I want to hear more about the global, the global nature of all of your businesses. But to go first, this idea of scaling, right now we're waiting for um, the government to approve the Time Warner acquisition by AT&T. Um, you have Sky, Sky is about, is about to have the remainder of it bought out by Fox. There are all sorts of different um, uh, acquisitions and M&A going on right now. My question for Netflix is, when you're competing with companies that are plat platforms, like Apple, like Amazon, does Netflix need to become a platform instead of just a service in order to compete? Do you need to merge with more of a distributor? No, we have to have a product and content that people die for. And that's what we focus all of our energy on, because then we make those platforms more relevant and we become vital to that platform. So not, it's not, uh, we don't have to own the platform. So no big, no big mergers with a Comcast or Apple or anything like that? Nothing to talk about. Yeah. Um, um, so for Fox, though, why is it that Fox wants to buy out the rest of, of Sky? I think it's about s scale on two different levels. I think scale for you know, business is very important because the counterparties that you're dealing with you know, are continually getting bigger. You know, so there's consolidation and distribution, and I think for us to have scale from a business perspective to have counterparties like Comcast and Charter and AT&T. It's important for us to have scale. I think on a creative level, I actually think scale is quite dangerous. I think we've spent a lot of time trying to be nimble and small on a creative level and having you know, very distinct brands, so FX and Fox and National Geographic and, and Fox Sports, you know, are quite are nimble in that way, but they all fall under a much bigger company. And I think that, that level of scale on a distribution and a business aspect, I think, is very important. Now, but for B-Skype, you already controlled it. Yeah. So why do you need to own the rest of it if you already controlled it? Well, we, contr we had de facto control in that we own 39% of it. But we don't consolidate it, and it's not something in which you can strategically work with Fox to expand. And I think there's a footprint inside Sky in terms of its direct consumer um, expertise, you know, it's a uh, scale across Europe. I think there's a lot more growth across Europe. And there's an expertise that we can export to the rest of the world, you know, as we continue to look at our business. And I think having um, a mixture of being a wholesaler and a retailer, I think is gonna be very important for us in the future. You know, we're 100% we're a wholesale business right now at Fox. You know, Ted's a, a, a retail business. Why do you wanna buy the Tribune channels? Um, I think, again, it's about controlling distribution. So, 
It was reported that we were um, engaged in a Would you like to confirm those reports? And <laughs> <laughs> I think the, uh, the reports were accurate. <laughs> um, I think the conversations is really about controlling distribution. I think we're very invested in the broadcast business. We think it's a wonderful business. Um, with the new UHF discount, you know, you have an opportunity to control more, more distribution. And I think as we face up to what will eventually be four main distributors in this country, I think having more scale, having more control of distribution on a broader footprint is important. Les, do you want to buy more channels? Um, if, if there's something that's a good deal, we'll buy it. We'll always look at it. But, you know, we, when you talk about scale, we look at it in two different ways. Obviously, we're competing against Disney, which is five times as big as we are, Fox, which is twice as big as we are, Comcast, which is six times as big as we are. Yet we feel like scale, we can control scale. And by that I mean we are primarily a content production company right now. We've gotten rid of outdoor, gotten rid of radio. The network business isn't what it used to be. Right now, we're producing for CBS, we're producing for Showtime, we're producing for CW, all assets that we own. But at the same time, we're producing for Netflix, we're producing for Amazon. Um, scale is what we make of it. You know, I love my assets, I love being able to be as hands-on as I am with our assets. If we were a great deal bigger, I couldn't do that. So we don't feel like we are substandard or being hurt by our size, I think we're nimble, we make decisions quickly, and uh, we will be able to expand however we want. The question is then, what about a merger with an, another company you might be familiar with, like a Viacom? Would there be advantages there to that kind of scale? That's, that's past. That's, uh, you, you know, we're looking, <laughs> we're looking forward. We're looking forward, not backward. You know, for obvious reasons, Viacom's fine and CBS is fine. And we like to say, because we're on every platform in the world virtually, you can't live without CBS just the way we are right now. You can't live without the NFL, without 60 Minutes, without Colbert, without Big Bang Theory. We're just fine. We compete content very to, well. Content to die for. That's what I was talking about. Right. Yeah. Content to die for. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but what about vertical integration? This idea of what Peter is talking about, this idea of owning the distribution. Obviously, we see you doing that more in the digital space, but what about with traditional distribution? Well, look, we own 27 television stations, so we're, we're not against that. I think what, yeah. what, what Peter's doing, or may be doing, I think is a very good idea. You know, it, if, if there were more CBS stations in that bunch, we probably would be doing the same thing as they are while there are more Fox stations there. So I think controlling your own stations, look, it's an interrelated business. Your production company is tied to your network, it's tied to your stations, and they are all interrelated. And the more you can make them work together, the more money you can make. But as we await the AT&T Time Warner merger and look at the other M&A that could follow, do you see CBS playing a role in that M&A? Who knows? There's, uh, life, life, is, life is long. There's, there'll be a lot of opportunity. <laughs> Jeremy, as the agent on the panel, <coughs> as you work with all these different media companies, how do you see the advantages and disadvantages of scale play out? Um, and, and the vertical <coughs> integration that we're starting to see more and more. I mean, I, I feel like I just look at it in terms of how are these companies positioning themselves for, for the future and who's getting stronger and who's taking advantage of of uh, the opportunities that are available. And, and, you know, to some degree, I think with scale, and, you know, today we talk about Time Warner as being a company that's subscale, but, you know, really, you know, for a long time, they were a pretty big company in, in the way we looked at them. And I, and I think some of the companies have suffered from being as big as they are because they were not able to innovate when they needed to innovate, sort of like the innovator's dilemma. Things were going so well, and they were so busy protecting their incumbent business that they couldn't see the innovation that was coming and they couldn't adapt to it. So a company, what happens is companies from the outside come and build themselves on top of us and grab a tremendous amount of market share, which is really what, what Ted has, Ted's company has done so successfully. And now you see the incumbent guys trying to sort of address that and build around it. I think, you know, Les was way ahead of it with, with, with <coughs> CBS All Access program, you know, and allowing people to get access to the content early. And I mean, even today, I think it was great that Fox announced they sold uh, the story of us to Hulu, and so they supported their own, 
their own platform, and now I, I think the, the, they're starting to come around to it, but sometimes you get so big and you're so busy protecting how big you are that you can't be as nimble and, and innovative as you need to be. Reese, what do you see as a content creator? Obviously, you're producing, you're, you're licensing books, you're deciding which companies you want to distribute through. You know, Ted joked to me on the phone that he was disappointed that you took Big Little Lies, which was a huge hit, and I'm a big fan of myself. You took that show not to Netflix, even though he wanted it, but to HBO. How do you make those I'm calls? sorry. <laughs> sorry, I wrote Good a lot of I'm right. sorry emails. It was a really hard decision. <laughs> um, no, I, I mean, I only come at it from being a content creator, much like Les, but obviously very small, and just coming at it from the passion of being mission-driven to create content for women. So really seeing a white space in that there's been a lot of stuff created, but not specifically tailored towards women. So when I look at big companies and all of the content that's being created, I think a new kind of way to look at it is how do we curate that? How is, how is certain um, content being custom built for direct audiences? Because I can look at the analytics on my Facebook and Instagram and tell you exactly who's watching what's on my channel, what's on my Insta story every single day. Each, each frame of it is trackable and each frame of it's data. And I feel like there's um, a whole world out there of choices. And when you're talking about um, really creating content that is specific and well-made and premium, I think I really I saw a white space to create content for women because I really saw a deficit in the marketplace. And so in addition to making this content like Big Little Lies and Wild, um, you have, you're launching this new platform called Hello Sunshine, mm -hmm. which is all about taking your brand and your content direct to consumer. What was behind that decision of launching this company and what's it gonna entail? Well, I, seeing after I did Gone Girl Wild, Big Little Lies, I started to see a bigger opportunity. Just seeing sort of numbers going down for women actually going to the box office and things like that. Really thinking, okay, well these women aren't just stopping watching movies. They're seeing it in different ways. They're seeing it on Netflix. They're watching HBO Go. So I'm also anecdotally sort of watching my children not even watch television anymore, only looking at YouTube, only looking at digital content. And I thought, other than mommy blogs, there's not a lot of content out there for interesting women, women who are very dynamic and they want to know more than how to make a chicken 12 ways. <laughs> um, so <laughs> I thought it was an interesting lane and I partnered with Peter Turnin and AT&T to expand that concept and create Hello Sunshine, which is going to launch this summer with lots of different ideas ideas for mobile and digital content, as well as traditional television and film. So all of you, in, in your own way, are bringing your content direct to consumer, unless you've been sort of an outlier to the media, um, the other media companies, in that you went direct to consumer with CBS All Access, did not participate um, in Hulu. What can you tell us about how that's going? Can you give us some CBS All Access numbers? No, I'm not going to give you the numbers. <laughs> you know, you know, as soon as Ted gives out numbers, we're going to get numbers. I was just going to offer you a trade. I was just going to offer you a trade. He's, he's led the way. We can hide right. behind Netflix. Well, we get, we get his subscriber right. numbers. Right. Yeah. By the way, Hulu is a phenomenal thing, and it's a great organization. We felt it was odd taking our content, which is the family jewels, and putting it in an organization with our competitors. And we decided to go our own way, and it was a, it was a different way to go. Hulu is wildly successful. But CBS All Access, we love what we're doing there. We obviously put the Good Wife spin-off there. We have Star Trek coming in the beginning, in the beginning of the fall. Um, it's going extremely well. I think, you know, we're out there. It's important. What we like to say to everybody is you can get CBS in a 500-channel universe if you want to buy it. You can get it in a skinny bundle. We're on Hulu as well. Yeah. Or you can buy it just with CBS for $5.99 and still get our content. We think it's the way to go. Showtime obviously has an OTT product as well. CBS News has a direct-to-consumer product. We think it's the wave of the future. You have to be everywhere. No matter how you want to get your content, we're going to be there for you. And when you say on Hulu, you mean the new Hulu TV channel, t TV service, which is the skinny bundle, $40 a month, which just launched today, I believe. Correct. Yeah. Um, Correct. In New York at the New Friends. But your CBS All Access product, Netflix does give us subscriber numbers. Can you tell us how it's going? If the good It's wife... going phenomenally well. You know, it, it, we, we've almost caught Netflix already. No, that's not true. And, uh... <laughs> CBS if, earnings if we were, are I'd tomorrow be on the beach somewhere. No. Yes. Um, <laughs> CBS earnings are tomorrow no, afternoon. No, by so. the way, that's right. CBS <laughs> earnings. No, but, but we're, we're really pleased with where it's going. It's above where our projections were. We, we realize we're not Netflix. We're one network. We're not Hulu. We're one network. But you get 
a lot of things on that one network, and uh, we're extremely pleased with, with what it is and what it's going to be. And how are you finding um, your sort of decisions about what content should be custom-made for this platform? Is the Good Wife spinoff different because you're making it just for CBS All Access? Is this Star Trek show going to be different because it's not designed... Um, for your traditional platform, it's a new it's a new medium. Look, so the Good Wife spinoff could have obviously been on CBS. It could have been on Showtime. It could have been on that Netflix. Netflix yeah. <laughs> um, you know, it, it could have been everywhere. Obviously, all access. If you're paying for it, we want it to be somewhat more premium. You know, we think of it closer to Showtime and and a lot of the things that Netflix is doing as well. Star Trek. We could have sold anywhere. Star Trek. There was a bidding war within CBS. It's obviously a very valuable property. We also learned from Netflix. Netflix, we put the other Star Trek series, and it did very well. They don't share the information, but <laughs> there were ways to hack into their, their, their information. Don't say hack. We, we, no, 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 no. We, we knew Star Trek did extremely well. They have a very, very loyal audience. We said if we give them a good product, that they will come and they will pay for it. It'll be special. And, that, and that's how we look at All Access. What about you, Peter? Oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, I mean, if you ever needed more proof that, there, that this isn't a zero-sum game, um, on the Star Trek series, we're doing it together, and we're launching it outside of the U.S., all over the world, and coming in as production partners. We've all been great partners together on making a show that could have been smaller, bigger, and it's, it's a net gain for everybody. And if I would have told you uh, 10 years ago when we first started streaming that we were going to get to 100 million subscribers and HBO was going to grow, you would have said that's insane. So I, I think it's a, that's the, that is the biggest proof point that this direct-to-consumer changes the equation for everything in entertainment. What are you guys finding at Fox? I mean, you're part of Hulu, you're doing more direct-to-consumer products as well. Sure, I think it's, again, going back to the idea of we've spent our entire history being a wholesaler and you know, really making content and then selling it to other people to distribute. And I think getting closer to consumers, being more personalized in television, I think it's the sense of... What do I want to watch? We're much in an on-demand economy in the sort of demand side rather than the supply side. So I think for us, Hulu's really important in that way. It gives us you know, a direct consumer product, um, and yet it doesn't mean that we're not really excited to be in business with Comcast and AT&T and these big companies and be part of a big bundle and to have our brands inside those big bundles, because I think audiences like to aggregate. They like to have lots of different viewpoints watch different shows, you know, I watch many, many different shows from Big Little Lies to the NFL, and so I need someone who's going to aggregate that for me. But, you know, Les just joked about not getting data from, from Netflix, and he's referring to the idea that we don't know what your Netflix ratings are, essentially. With Hulu, you're going to get a lot of data about exactly what people are watching, probably more valuable data than Fox has ever received sure. in the past. What does that mean for you? How is that going to change your decision-making? I think data is... There's decision-making that you can use it for. There's also addressable advertising. And I think that addressable advertising would be a massive um, opportunity for us you know, and for Les and for the other companies that are in the advertising business over the next few years. You, know, you have $200 million spent in this country on marketing. And you know, being able to have the best product, and television is the best product for delivering an advertising message and being able to do it in an addressable way I think that's the big difference that's going to come from data. You know, I think that's a huge opportunity for us, and I think that we're just at the beginnings of it. Before we get too much more into advertising, I want to get your response to the, um, to the launch of Hulu TV today. And the fact, and I'm curious for Jeremy's as well, so this idea that now there's this explosion of offerings out there that are separate from traditional TV. These are you know, cord cutter, cord never products, $40 and less. Is this going to keep people from subscribing to Netflix? No, I don't. It's, I'd look at it as the growth of internet television raises all boats, and it's a great thing. To, it's a great evolution of consumer behavior that everyone gets to benefit from. So the more people get engaged in, in alternate ways to watch television, that's great for everybody. Jeremy, when you talk to your clients, do they want to create original content for digital distribution, or do, do they still feel the appeal of, of traditional TV? I mean, does, does HBO win over, win over Netflix when you're trying to distribute, you know, I mean, there's well, once it did, for once. sure. What? We can point to at least once. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it, 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 right now, our, our clients, it used to be, they would come and say, I really want to sell a show to HBO, and that was the pent-ultimate place. It felt like the most creative freedom and the most premium opportunity. Now Netflix has become that 
thing when people say, oh, maybe we can sell it to Netflix. But that tends to cycle through based on people's experiences and all kinds of perceptions and, and things that occur. There's two different kinds of experience, though, that the experience of having your show drop all at once in that one moment, some creators love it and some creators don't appreciate it as much because they feel like the experience of having week after week people following it and talking about it and having extending the water cooler conversation. So when Reese's great show was on, it was like every week people would come in the office Monday morning in the staff meeting, you know, and they'd be talking, oh, did you see the, you know, wasn't that great? But, and so you get an extended conversation. Some creators are very, really appreciate that. And, and they get emails eight weeks later, they're still getting emails about how much people love their show as opposed to in the binge experience. So different people have a different experience, a different desire, a different way to have their content consumed. The good news is, is you know, all of the players these days who are doing premium content are really, really respectful for the most part of their creators, and the creators have a positive experience. Reese, what, what is your perspective as a content creator? I mean, do you see the appeal of having eight episodes drop at once, or would you rather, or do, do you think the conversation about Big Little Lies was different because it was spread out? I do think, yeah. I mean, there's room for traditional um, rollout, and I think that's really interesting to me because we had no idea if that would work or not. And um, But obviously the streaming service too. I mean, we saw the numbers just grow and grow and grow and grow. So as, as time goes on, um, you know, obviously the numbers rise, and they do tell you all the numbers, which is nice. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's good; it's validating in yeah. some capacity. And um, but you, uh, but I do think there's still room for the excitement of a big spectacle movie and the big sort of water cooler talk of a great premium show. So I think it's great, as, as Ted says. I think it, you know the idea that services are available to as many people as possible is just it's. It's creating a great uh, platform and an ability for, for customers that they can see film and television in so many different ways. So I was glad for both of the, the abilities to watch the show. But um, it was very exciting. Um, one thing that's interesting is, you know, you mentioned movies. Now, Netflix is making 40 to 50 movies a year, you will. How many of those will get some theatrical distribution? Well, though, the theatrical that we'll do is mostly in a couple of theaters, New York and LA. But you'll do a couple of theaters for all of them to and day, qualify? And all day and date, no pre, no pre theater, no pre. And that's, you're putting them in theaters mostly to qualify for awards or is it to yeah. help in the marketing and advertising of them? Both, I mean, but, but I think that for the most part it's for the, the awards qualification and to push it out into the marketplace and give something. Some people, if we if if had it our way, I don't get to book theaters, but if, if we had it our way, the theaters would book the movies day and date in their theaters, we'd be happy to have, have consume, more consumer choice. I'm not trying to keep anything away from theaters. Love theaters. I go to the theaters all the time. I, what we are trying to say is that people mostly want to have the access to the content when it's top of mind and having it available on Netflix or when we're going to go out Friday night. It'd be very tough for me to compete with I want to go out Friday night. But if people just want to watch the, a great movie, they get to watch it on Netflix the same day. We think it's a good way to, to bring it out. Uh, our subscribers pay for those movies with their subscriber dollars, so I don't want to hold them out for five, six, seven months uh, and not give them access to it, even if, especially if they don't live anywhere near a theater, which is most of the population. So I'm, our plan is that they, these are direct to Netflix movies, and they're movies on an enormous theatrical scale. Jeremy, what does this trend mean for talent? Putting movies in theaters, just in a couple of theaters, but this idea of launching movies first on Netflix. I mean, will we see more? You know, again, it's that... Some, you know, we're, Ted and I are in business with a client right now who has a desperate yearning for a theatrical experience. You want to tell and us who it, it is? <laughs> not right now. There's a few. There's a few. It's, and it's, it's really important it's, to It's generational. It, it really. defines who he is. It's how we grew up. It's how he grew up falling in love with movies, and he doesn't want to be separated from that experience. And there's other filmmakers who are excited to be able to tell the story they want to tell and happy for that to premiere on Netflix. I think if Ted wanted to have it his way, he could. He could just take petty cash and buy Regal, and uh, he'd have 2,000 screens. He could release his movies whenever he wanted, however <laughs> he wanted, but that's a different company. You asked about M&A. That's an acquisition we definitely do not want to get involved. <laughs> <laughs> On the record, Ted Sarandos does not want to buy Regal. Okay. Yeah. Um, or any theater. Yeah. I'll, I'll do respect to Regal. That would solve the problem, though, of trying to, to tighten the window between Look, theatrical and home video release that so many studios have been really struggling There was a time that they didn't want to put sound in movies, and even when they finally did, <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't give dialogue. They didn't, they didn't think that people wanted to hear actors talk, so they only put the music parts in. 
And now look at it. I mean, and they would say that talking movies weren't real movies. So people are saying that a movie that isn't in the theaters isn't a real movie. It's just a generational thing. And I, and I do believe that what, the way that what, what Jeremy described, there's a, a generation of filmmakers who really grew up making movies for small art house audiences, and that's what they, that's what they get out of bed for in the morning. And that, and that is a business that will continue. It's a small business, but it is a business. And it's, I feel like for us, it's happened, what I really want to do is be able to take great storytelling that used to be relegated to a single art house screen in New York and make it available to the world. And we think it's a real big scalable business that you can keep making movies. Otherwise, it's mostly philanthropy. <clears throat> so. I do think the day and date opportunity that, that does exist is a big one. And I do think that will actually just increase the overall size, uh, you know, the overall revenue for a movie. And, and we need to get closer to, Look, we need to get that to happen. Historically, I think the television business learned a lot from the, mu the music business, which missed the boat yes. initially. Mm -hmm. And television said, let's get out in front of that. Let's get out there. Let's go direct to consumer. Netflix obviously changed the world. But we all participated in it. I think the theatrical business is going to have to change their model. Yeah. The TV business is thriving better and better. I think the theatrical business is more challenged, and they're going to have to rethink the way they do business. It's really the only form of entertainment that hasn't been impacted by the internet, <clears throat> the theatrical movie windowing. So I don't, I mean, it, clearly I think it's one of those things where every other business has grown around it, having broad instant access. And I think in, you know, a lot of people point to Get Out as a really a phenomenal story about how, um, you know, the business, that model's still alive. A little tiny movie that did a did great business because it was out in theaters. I, th I think the opposite. I think it was an enormous opportunity. If that movie was available day and date in most places <laughs> in the world, that movie could have done five, ten times the business in 25 days. Well, I think you'd say uh, it about Get Out, and I think you could say it about Guardians of the Galaxy this weekend. Absolutely. I think that movie will do huge theatrical business and would also benefit from a day and day release. Yeah. Reese, do you feel like you and your fellow filmmakers are increasingly more open to having movies not come out in theaters? Or do you think that there's going to be a push from filmmakers to shorten the window? It's been my experience that, just like Jeremy said, it's about 50-50. And the people who grew up with that experience of the theater are sort of slow to change. But I also think like there's a lot of um, people who are really reticent about social media as well who do what I do, and particularly like um, the generation above me. and. You know, and I kind of liken it to the conversation like when they invented the telephone. It's like, well, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> no, I'll just walk over to my friend's house instead. <laughs> I, just, I like the walk. I, I know. Like walk. Or like when they invented the car, they're like, no, I'm just going to take a bike. <laughs> but, and I think, um, I don't know, things change. And it's about the customer first. I mean, I don't know an actor or a director who wouldn't want more people to yeah. see their material. And just with Big Little Lies, to look at those numbers, there's more people than I've ever had see a movie ever. You know, my, my highest, maybe maybe not my highest grossing movie, which was an animated film, but my second highest grossing film, this outnumbered that by m tens of millions. Reese, it's time for you to do network yeah, television. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, just, just, just <laughs> don't, don't give me that face. <laughs> that's that's Is not that nice. There's about to be a card that's exchange. Absolutely an offer. <laughs> Just to stand up for the movie-going experience for a, minute, for a moment, because I love the movies, um, I think there is something different about the experience of watching something on a, you know, hundred-foot screen than on a television or a, a phone. And I think they're actually designed to be watched in that way. And I think there's a sense of scale and being surrounded by sound that is unique and different. I don't think that they are mutually exclusive, but. I'll be super sad if I can't get that experience. Well, it seems like maybe it won't go away, but that yeah. there might... The day and date, yeah. Because, yeah. I mean, yeah. Th that's true of a football game, too. And they happen, that always happens day and date. Yeah. Um, so the other... What do you mean it's true of a football game? That there's a wildly different experience going out to a oh, game sure. and seeing it and sitting in the stadium and drinking beer and having fun with, with the crowd. You and feel like Ted's had this that's argument That's better at home. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what I've been telling you all the time, food is day and day, yeah. but people still go to restaurants. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's a little off topic. So, okay, so then the other question about reaching big audiences, of course, creating content that has global reach. Um, Fox, perhaps more than any other media company, is really focused on this. How would you explain what your global strategy is, especially when it comes to content that you make here? Sure, I think... Look, I think Hollywood is unique in the world. I think it's a place where storytellers from around the world come because the best actresses in the world want to work with the best directors and the best cinematographers. And they've attracted the best people in the world and they've, it's come to Hollywood and no one's replicated that. And Fox is one of the five or six factories in the world that 
is able to make premium video at that kind of scale. And I think it's a big advantage that we have. And we've used that to expand around the world. And we have channels in almost every country in the world. We distribute movies and television. And then we've started to make um, television and movies around the world. And whether that's in India or Argentina, you know, it's a very sort of, there's local creativity. And I think it's for us, it's built on the touchstone of Hollywood. So whether that's The Simpsons, which is still a cornerstone of the Sky schedule, it's one of the number one shows we have across our Latin American channels. You know, it's really important what we do here. And I think um, it is ultimately about the excellence of the storytelling. And Hollywood's unique in that way. But so what's the plan long term? How much of your revenue do you want to generate from overseas um, local language product versus global product versus sure. domestic? Well, the Sky deal will change the, um, the view of the company. I think 40% of our company will then be in Europe. So it'll change the, gravi the center of gravity a little bit. I think it will enable us to make you know, much more content in Europe. Um, our Italian business in particular at Sky you know, has had a phenomenal few years. Um, they just made The Young Pope for HBO. Um, they've made um, a, a series of big you know, hit shows that have begun to travel outside of Italy. So I think it will change the center of gravity and it'll enable us to do more local production. Our Latin American business is now doing much more local production. And we're continuing to get into local sports. So we just did a 10-year deal for the Argentinian Soccer League, which is the equivalent of having the NFL. We're a 15-year partner with the Dutch Soccer League. You know, we, were, we founded the EPL with, um, you know, at Sky. So I think that level of being really localized and having big Hollywood content, I think, is a winning formula for us. Let's, what about with CBS? Obviously, people think of CBS as having these U.S. television channels, but your well, content we, has legs abroad. About 12% of our revenue comes international, and still, our product still sells. NCIS and CSI are still two of the huge sellers throughout the world that make millions of dollars an episode. We buy, and, we buy them in lots of territories, and they're great. I love it. So. Keep going. <laughs> no, no so, so every decision we make regarding production the international marketplace becomes really, really important. As Ted said, we couldn't be, afford to be doing Star Trek or the quality of the show without Netflix help, who bought the rest of the world for a very nice fee, may I add. <laughs> um, and and it, it frankly, you know, the marketplace has exploded all over the world. And, uh, you know, American content is still the best. They still want American content. They've tried to do quotas on it. It's never worked. I, I, I truly believe this community does the best content, which translates the best. So do you, do you, ex do you expect... Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, content is king. Content um, is king, right. Um, do you expect the amount of revenue you get from overseas to, to grow significantly? Absolutely. It, well, it, it gives us the excuse to continue to produce more and more content. As long as it's quality, our whole summer theory until about five years ago, networks were not doing original content in the summer. And then we were able to make a deal with Netflix to take it domestically, and the international marketplace, so basically, summer ratings which are greatly depressed, through those two things, through an SVOD service here in the States, and through a big international sale, it's changed the entire business. So, as I said, every single piece of property we do, we consider the international revenue, and it's a major piece of it, and it's going to continue to grow. And how much does that influence sort of content decisions, what you greenlight? You know what? You know that a Star Trek will travel. You know a good wife might, necess might necessarily do nearly as well. It's a much more American st show. It's much more talking involved versus action adventure. So it does affect your decisions, but not exclusively. You, you sort of know what's going to sell and, and how well it's going to sell. So Netflix has been obviously investing in its global presence. You're in something like 200 countries, I believe now. Um, what's your plan to continue to generate content on the global scale and then also on the local language scale? Well, you were already you know, near 50-50 in terms of people watching outside of the US and inside the US. Uh, we have about 38 shows now that we premiere uh, on Netflix around the world that premiere somewhere else first or, you know, or simultaneously. We're actually releasing one episode a week on those as they come out on the networks, like shows like Designated Survivor 
our Netflix original show outside of the US, everywhere else. So we're doing this on a really large scale about on the Hollywood side. But I think what's really intriguing, what's happening now is as we're continuing to expand the global footprint and giving people access to programming, for the first time we're getting a sense of, if you have a choice, what will you watch? So on one way, it's super encouraging that a lot of, in a lot of countries, Hollywood content has been underdistributed historically on television. So you look at it and go, wow, that's a, that's a local market and this is a domestic market. But what we're finding is, is that um, it's much closer to the, the global market um, when, you, when people have choices in places that they never watched US content, they're watching more US content. But really exciting is when we could take a show, like I mentioned at the beginning, we produced a show in Brazil called The 3%. Mm -hmm. It's a science fiction, dystopian story, um, full Portuguese language, Brazilian production. We release it globally. It gets an enormous amount of viewing outside of Brazil and millions of people. And by cable TV standards, it would be a very big hit in the US based on Netflix US viewing. And it's all in local language subtitles and dubs. Um, we have a show, uh, Fauda, that we uh, license out of Israel that the normal behavior would be, that's a big hit, let's make an American version of it and try to sell it around the world. Instead, we have put Fauda on around the world in local language with subtitles and dubs and it's an enormous hit around the world for us. And less expensive than reproducing it. In for English. sure, and yeah. that's a, that, and if you asked about scale, yeah. there's a great way of saying things that are being made in, with tremendous quality and giving them a global footprint at, right out of the gate versus reinventing the wheel to make everything in a Hollywood model and then redistributing it out. So I think like great storytellers like Jose Padilla from Narcos, um, it, his ability to become a global storyteller on an equal footing with a Hollywood storyteller is really unprecedented and, and I think we'll see a lot more of it. Jeremy, where's the biggest opportunity for your clients overseas and for your business? Well, I think the opportunity for our clients, uh, China is something that we're all, you know, uh, seeing big opportunities in China that, that our clients are very curious about how to most effectively either work in China or create content for the Chinese market. Um, but, but really, you know, it's hard, to, it's hard to not imagine that most of the world is, is a big opportunity. I mean, some of the conversations here about the developments in, in Africa and how that's a real emerging economy is, is exciting and interesting. So our clients are, we're just trying to figure out how do we help our clients uh, get the most efficient financing, looking at you know, how do you do, you know, if you're going to go your own way and not be part of one of the big media companies, how do you, you know, what is the plan for marketing and monetization? Because that becomes a challenge. You create great content, but if you can't figure out a way to market it and monetize it, it's not gonna do you that much good. So those are some of the things our clients are thinking about and being able to think about how different parts of the world can become part of your formula, part of your financing mix. Is, is something that's really important for us. Any examples that you'd like to share of the sort of global financing, global? I mean, there's, there's a, number, an, a number of examples. Um, we were actually involved in the Young Pope, so we represent that production entity, and we were involved in car crafting that deal, bringing HBO in. I mean, that's, a, that's a, a perfect example of the kind of show that originated out of Italy got put together, financed internationally, and then brought into the US, and we were in the middle of that transaction. Reese, um, you, you must have had to travel the world for different films that you've been on to promote them internationally. Do you see that international piece and the fact that the international box office is growing so dramatically, playing a different role and a bigger role in, in film decisions, either for you or for the studios you work with? Certainly, I mean, just in the past five years, obviously the, the box office in overseas is much, much more uh, robust than the, the domestic box office. So that's just sort of my experience. But to speak to what Ted, I thought was really interesting what you said about taking a piece of material and not Americanizing it. I mean, we talk about creating <laughs> characters on film and in television that are reflective of the world we live in. The world's getting smaller and smaller and that people need to see themselves reflected on film in order to create empathy. And as an actor, I think that's such an incredible thing to not then, you know, Americanize a piece of material and then redistribute it. It's actually just to subtitle it and put it out as is. Is a big, that's a big social, impactful, meaningful thing to be doing to create empathy in this world and and for people to actually see themselves is like a, a big mandate of of mine to see characters that are more diverse and culturally diverse and 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 more global faces, but also just create content for women all over the world. I think I think that's um, I think that's really. Fantastic. Thanks. 
Um, Jeremy, you mentioned China, and um, I know Netflix recently signed a licensing deal. You're going to be distributing your content through an existing distributor in China rather than going direct in China. Obviously, um, China is a huge piece of the global box office. Um, and there's a lot of hope that the, um, the limits on the number of movies allowed into China every year will expand. But I think there's also a lot of sort of frustration about doing business in China and making sure that Hollywood movies can, can do as well um, overseas as possible. What is sort of the next frontier for raising the profile of and the box office of U.S. films in China? And then the big, the big frustration, of course, being the percentage of revenue that the U.S. studios get to take home. Yeah. I mean, I think the next frontier is, is, is maybe a better understanding. And while we're trying to figure them out, that marketplace is developing and their taste is developing. I mean, uh, a movie that we were involved with, uh, Dog's Purpose, which was a DreamWorks movie, our client directed it, has turned out to wildly overperform there, something that no one really foresaw. So where we think that that market wants, you know, robots exploding and this and that, the other thing, there's the market, their taste is, you know, their taste is changing and, and becoming, I don't want to say more sophisticated, that's a judgment, but certainly expanding. And I think understanding that marketplace and, and ultimately realizing that if we can just, you know, once again, generate great stories, you know, great storytellers, those things are going to travel. And uh, I think we need to, to think about that marketplace at its most sophisticated level as opposed to trying to dumb it down. China is really the last frontier for Netflix, the only country where you don't really have direct distribution. Are you disappointed that you can't go direct and you have to go through a distributor? Yeah, I mean, I'm glad it's not uniquely Netflix. I mean, so we, we definitely did our best to get in there and get, but we're a pure play online media company that's not that, that attractive to China in terms of the, in the current regime. They want to, they'd rather have a Chinese company serve the China market. So, By the way, Uber just sort of fell in line with the Chinese yeah, Uber yeah, as yeah. well. So but really what we're excited about the, the Aichi deal was that we get some of our programming into China, give Chinese people legal options to watch great shows that they love, and we know that they do because we see it in the piracy data from China. Um, and, that, and the economics are, are not that meaningful, uh, but it's a first toe in the water to kind of get it out there, get our shows out with the Netflix branding on it to get it introduced into the market in a, in a meaningful way and still maintain some optionality for us in China down the road. And I'm pretty sure it'll be significantly down the road. Um, and it's, remember these, these uh, quotas on the films, they apply to TV shows too. Mm -hmm. So we already have more content than any one company in China can buy. So we have to figure out a way to work across all the suppliers in China. How important is China for Fox? Um, on the television side, not very important. You know, we're not allowed to own channels. We own channels in almost every country in the world. Um, um, whether that's African countries or mm -hmm. Greenland or... Um, North Korea and China are not places that we own channels. Um, so it's something where we're looking for partnerships, we sell content into um, Chinese partners, but it's not a particularly significant business for us. Are the CBS shows huge in China? Not, not very many. The only one that's doing really well is the Big Bang Theory, but we haven't been paid anything for it. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the, I, the Chinese market is finally opening up for American television. There are finally some legitimate sales, but, but as Peter said, it's still a very if you, small... But if you believe piece. the headlines, the piracy issues are, seem to be getting better. Is that they true? Are. They are. That's what, I, that's what we have heard, that they're <laughs> getting a lot better. And eventually you'll get paid for it. Yeah. yeah. Um, speaking of the Big Bang Theory, your upfront advertising presentation is two weeks from today. Yep. What are your expectations for the upfront ad market this year? I'm going to say what I say every year. It's going to be up. It's going to be great. It's going to be... <laughs> uh, CPMs are good. The marketplace is good. You know, content is good. Uh, you know, I'm looking forward to it. Upfront week is always a lot of fun. Pilot season is great. Peter and I were talking about it. You know, you, you, you get surprised by your pilots, you get surprised both ways. It's something that's a sure <laughs> shot. You got a great star, a great director, a great script, and you say, what happened? And then out of nowhere comes Everybody Loves Raymond, which yeah. was like something we picked up because David Letterman was producing it. And it became great. So it's a fun time of the year. We look forward to going to New York and putting the schedule together and, uh, and, and selling them. And, uh, you know, I, th I think the upfront, I think the marketplace is going to be strong. And now you get to go in the upfront without the hassle of a strike. That's, isn't that a relief? I think everybody's <laughs> great, greatly relieved. <laughs> I think it's, it's 
the great thing. Yeah. There were many reports on Sunday that you played a critical role in resolving the dispute between the WGA and the studios, in part because so much is at stake for the television business right now. Are you concerned about there being a, a, an actor strike or anything that could really send people cord cutting? No, not really. N number one, you know, it's that, that, that your statement's a little exaggerated. I think the companies were all together. Peter was very active. Uh, all the companies were together. Uh, we had a united front, and guess what? We were very sympathetic to what the writers were asking for. It, this wasn't, oh my God, they're, they're crazy. The span issues about doing eight episodes over 12 months was absolutely valid. The health and pension were valid issues. Um, you know, I'm very happy it was over. It, there was a lot of buildup, and it ended very quickly, which, which I was glad. And I think we're all relieved. I think a lot of us who, who have been around a while remember 10 years ago and how dreadful that 100-day strike was. And at the end of the day, I don't think anybody won from that. So I think, I think the companies got involved earlier. And, and I think it was a good dialogue. It just took a little longer than we would like. I would highly doubt, I'm very hopeful that SAG will, you know, we, we sort of have a pattern. There are things that will be special to the actors that I truly believe we'll be sympathetic to and we'll be able to get a deal there. And uh, I think the town is very, very relieved, as I said, that we're all going to keep working. What's your outlook for that front, Peter? Um, I'd echo what, um, what Les said. I think the scatter market has been very vibrant. I think that the issues that digital media is having around advertising and around adjacency, I think is going to accrue to the benefit of television. Um, and I think that the is still the need to sell things. And I think having you know, a full frame, 30 seconds, audio, video ad in the NFL, in Big Bang Theory, inside Empire, you know, that's the best way to get a message out. And I, I think the market's going to be very vibrant for that reason. The digital media adjacency issue you're talking about, what you're referring to is this idea that Google was boycotted by hundreds of advertisers sure. in the UK because ads were shown next to effectively terrorist content. Yeah. Um, and there was a lot of pressure put on Google to do a better job policing their content. And today, Facebook announced they're hiring 3,000 more people to make sure that there aren't videos of murderers being posted on the site. How much do those issues directly benefit the TV business? Well, I think those issues have always affected the TV business. We have standards and practices groups that are constantly... But I mean backlash to Google and Facebook. Yeah, but I think we've always looked at... We've always understood that advertisers adjacency is really important to them for both positive reasons and negative reasons. So positive reasons, I wish to be associated with this particular program, and negative reasons is I don't need my brand associated with that. And if they are you know, truly objectionable material, I think that brands have a, you know, it's important for them to recognize where their material can be, and it can be very damaging to a brand. And, and, I think and you know, a few years back, Digital was the shiny new object. And by the way, digital advertising is very important. It's very valid. It's going to grow and grow and grow. But, but as Peter was saying, an advertiser knew they were buying Empire. Yeah. They knew they were buying the Big Bang Theory. They didn't want to go out and have their advertising attached to pornography, which often happened. In addition, the counting on a lot of the digital ads were by machines. So I think the return in, on investment, and, and once again, I am a commercial for network television, but the return on investment, you know how many people are watching, and you know how many people are watching your commercial, and you know what product you're attached to, and that's, that's a good thing. And I think measurement's an important thing, and I think we live in a world where an impression on CBS you know, is identical to an impression on Fox in terms of how it's measured. An impression on, you know, Facebook or Google or Twitter or Snapchat is very different. So, you know, certain of the digital companies love to say they have a Super Bowl every day. We, we had the Super Bowl this year, and we looked at the actual numbers. We delivered, you know, I think 16 billion minutes um, of advertising inside the Super Bowl. That would have taken, I think, Facebook 10 years of their entire video portfolio to deliver that many impressions. And I, I think that that part of the debate around digital advertising versus um, television advertising has to happen. We, you can't have one impression on CBS or Fox is 60 minutes of watching an entire show and every commercial in it. One digital impression is three seconds, 50% of the screen. 
those are not the same things. And I think that people are really beginning to understand that. But as we saw in Facebook earnings that were reported just about an hour and a half ago, they are still managing to ramp dramatically. They are. And they're generating a lot of revenue for video ads. Do you think that some of the ad dollars that moved over to digital will directly come back to traditional television? Or do you think that they I, were coming from other places? I, I think some of it already has. I think the right mix is important. Mm -hmm. I, I think you, they, they, they work together well, where you have digital along with, with television. And I think that's what's happening. Uh, and that's happening more effectively. I agree. I mean, I, mean, I, don't, buy the, I don't buy the art, buy the advertising. We did buy half a minute of that. Super Bowl money for Bright, but um, <laughs> and I think it's a combination of those things. Like the the spot itself creates a digital echo that really carries the brand a, a pretty far. Uh, but part of that's part of the mix. Like I don't think outdoor advertising is particularly efficient. Although but, you have a lot of billboards in LA. But, but what happens is people take pictures of them and tweet them and put them on their Facebook post and talk about them. And the, the, sometimes the content of the outdoor advertising becomes the the topic for social media, and people talk about that ad. So it's, it's, it is a mix of all those things that matter. With the demand for high quality content um, from advertisers, do you see Netflix ever doing branded content? No, I mean, I think it's part of our brand promise is that it's commercial free, there's an integrity to it that uh, you can do it in some creative way, but the, the, the more that it works for us, the less it would probably work for the advertiser. So we're not pursuing it particularly. We think the model is all built on subscription. With <laughs> people happy not to have ads, I said branded content, not necessarily ads. Um, um, Jeremy, there's been a lot of talk here about social media. Reese mentioned that she's using it because it's ridiculous not to use this format that you know two billion people around the world use Facebook. Um, but here they're talking about how um, their ads are more effective than social media. Do you find your clients use social media more as a promotional tool? Or do you think there's a po possibility to generate meaningful revenue for content creators on Snapchat or Facebook um, or Twitter the, or Instagram? The potential to generate meaningful revenue exists. Right now, it's much more of a promotional tool. And you, you know, our, our clients, particularly music, the music client, most, the most, the people who are using it most effectively are the music clients, and you see how how native that experience is for many of them. So for clients of ours like DJ Khaled, who's probably the king of Snapchat, has really used it effectively. But then, you know, Drake and others are able to, you know, they're able to launch an album with massive social, with massive global impact almost immediately using almost exclusively social tools. And Kevin I think Hart that, and comedy, same way. Yeah, and I think that's really significant to understand, and I think the tradition, you know, the movie and television business needs to get better and needs to understand how to use those tools better. And I think the actors and, you know, performers have to figure out a way that they can do it that's organic. When it's not organic, it feels, not, it feels unauthentic and people don't react well to it. But when it works organically, and, you know, we represent Kevin Hart, who's, who's really uses it very authentically. It's very organic to who he is. He loves it. He's got an enthusiastic relationship with his audience. And it really, it really serves him well and serves the, the movies that he does very, very well. Reese, what's your plan for Hello Sunshine? Have you thought about whether you want to create content that will live on Snapchat and make money on Snapchat? Or is it more about using Snapchat and Instagram as, as promotional tools? Um, well, definitely probably a mix of both. I mean, um, we're talking to different companies and brands about you know, um, not necessarily branded content, but partnerships that it would, you know, benefit and really reach exactly their audience and target those audiences. But it's a brand new company. <laughs> I'm like, I'm sitting on a desk with some of the most experienced people, and I'm in my baby stages of my company. But my main, I'm mission driven in that I just want to find more female filmmakers, which I think is an imperative thing at this point. It's, it's um, there's an incredible lack of female storytellers in our industry, um, and showcase more women's stories. I think, you know. It, it's, uh, I think there's an audience out there that is being greatly underserved, and, um, and that's my perspective. So we'll see how it goes. Maybe I'll be back here in three years. Definitely, <laughs> two years, one year. Yeah. Um, what, are you, what are you hearing from your clients, Jeremy? Um, relative to social media? Yeah, or in sort of creating content. I mean, I mean they're, they're, again, they're excited about the yeah. possibilities, but they also, you know, uh, Clients, they want, they, want to, they want feedback. They yeah. want to feel like they're in a relationship. So 
sometimes you're just pouring it into an ocean and there's not the kind of response they want and then there's no real monetization model yeah. around it so it becomes sort of an, em an empty experience. Um, there are, you know, we're in the midst of building a couple of companies where there is a monetization engine yeah. available. We work with a company called Narrative that is one of the sort of leading forces at Snapchat who's actually figuring out how do you, you know, marry content and brands and deliver uh, revenue back to the creators and there's a company we represent and work closely with. So, yeah. so it's, it's coming along, it's developing, but it's not quite there yet. It's certainly a good narrative is a great example. Now, um, I remember after the election, there was a lot of conversation about how, you know, does content need to change to address this whole um, portion of America that are Trump voters, that maybe the content creation business Hollywood may not have recognized in the past. Les made some comments about how good President Trump has been for advertising. What does President <laughs> no, Trump mean no, for? No, 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 you're misquoting me. <laughs> the, the political landscape. It was, there was, there was, there, there was 17 candidates at the time. Sorry. And I was talking it, and the question, it was, it was a thing like, panel like this, was how is political advertising? It literally was February of a year ago. How is political advertising? I said, it looks like it's gonna be great this year. There's a lot of contentiousness, and that usually means a big ad spend. I then said, so bring on the contentiousness. Yeah. Donald Trump may not be good for America, but he's good for CBS. <laughs> it was a joke. It was a joke. And it was over a so, year ago, yeah. Anyway. And you doubled down. <laughs> and, you know, and okay. I've gotten in a lot of trouble for that, okay. you know. Look, we, we, we program for America, you know. We program for America. We're, 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 we really are the big tent. We program, you know, from Dwight Eisenhower to uh, John Kennedy, et cetera, et cetera. We do not say, all right, Donald Trump is president. Let's make our programming somewhat different. You know, that, that's not how it goes. Um, but obviously advertising uh, for your news shows has benefited uh, as ratings have been up in, with so much interest in politics these days. Um, but do you feel like there's been a change in content you know, in the wake of the election, is, there, is, is America looking for a different kind of content, or do you feel like you've always been serving all Americans with your content? As, as I said, we, you yeah. know, NCIS, NCIS works now, and it worked yeah. during Obama. What about and it worked Fox? during Bush. Yeah. Um, I think a broadcast network is always looking to be a broadcast network and be as broad as possible. Um, and then other networks, you know, whether that's with the NFL or whether it's with big shows. And there are other networks where you're trying to be more niche. You know, so where you're trying to be the very, very favorite show of somebody rather than the favorite show of everybody. <coughs> so I think that Hollywood's always reflected the culture, mm -hmm. and I think Hollywood leads the culture because that's what storytellers like to do. So I think the political era we're in will absolutely have an effect on storytelling, mm -hmm. um, and I think that you'll see that start to come through over the course of the next 12 to 24 months. Um, and probably in ways that we don't truly understand and, and expect, because I think that's the beautiful thing about unique storytellers, is that they capture something in the culture that isn't obvious, but when you know, somebody comes up with a new show or a, or a new movie, you're like, oh, that reflects it, and now I understand. Mm -hmm. Reese has talked an, uh, a number of times about having a mission-driven company and wanting to give voice to more female filmmakers. Um, obviously, I know you don't oversee Fox News, but there have been a number of lawsuits there, and there's a big conversation going on right now about whether there's inequality in the workplace. We heard about it a lot in Silicon Valley. But is there inequality in the nature of stories that are being told? Is this something you think about at your part of Fox? I think that it's really important for us to reflect the environment in which we live. So whether that is, you know, so that we reflect a really diverse country that we live in, and I think we have to do that in the stories that we tell, in the storytellers that tell them, um, and in, the, in our workplaces. And I think it's just bad business if we don't do that. Diversity is good for business. Yeah. Um, and how do you think about that in Netflix? I mean, obviously, you're trying to program for everyone as well. Yeah, I mean, we've got a 100 million people. Some of them spend hours a day watching Netflix. Uh, we're trying to appeal to a lot of taste. As Peter said, you're not trying to make something for everybody. You're trying to find something for everybody. It may, may not be the same show. Um, I, I do I agree. Diversity is great for programming. It's great for every aspect of business. Um, it's great for everything, so it wouldn't be unique to content. Um, so we definitely get out there. We've definitely made a point to do to serve an underserved market. 
in that we have a lot of our shows that really do center on very strong female characters, female showrunners, female writers, uh, that because half the population is, and, and it really has worked well for us. We're almost out of time, but I would be remiss if I didn't ask a question about the two panelists who are suing each other right now. So. <laughs> Jeremy and Liz? No, no. <laughs> Never. <'Cause I'm> sad. <laughs> no. Um, Netflix and Fox are embroiled in a legal battle or a legal dispute over um, labor agreements. Is this lawsuit that's happening something that's um, unique because it's a traditional company versus a digital company? Well, I wouldn't have guessed a few months ago that we would be the least interesting labor story at News Corp. But. <laughs> so, no, I, You're just I, think it, there. I think generally it just, um, I don't know, we're, we're, we obviously can't talk about yeah. it. But, yeah. but it, it <laughs> Look, I think, uh, yeah, ultimately, you know, we sued Netflix and they've sued us back. And I think our perspective is, Netflix was inducing people to break contracts, which were personal services contracts. And, you know, I guess we can't talk about it. <laughs> ultimately, <clears throat> there's, in California law, there's a, a great history of the fact that they're legal. And Netflix takes a different point of view, and Ted can speak to that for himself. And I think ultimately, we want to play, understand what the rules are. And I think personal services contracts, if the California court decides that no one's allowed to have personal services contracts, we'll live with that, our business will go on. I think there's a lot of people who work for us who actually want those contracts. It provides them with security, it provides them with an understanding of how they're going to pay their mortgages and how they're going to put their kids through school. And, you know, I think that it's a really important topic that we have a very different point of view on. We're a non-contract culture and I think we have to compete for employees the same way we have to compete for everything else. And we do that by paying top of market and creating a great work environment. And we'll let the courts settle whether or not these things are enforceable or not. I remember years ago, I believe it was you who said, we need to become HBO before HBO comes us. Yeah. yeah. And it was this, and I think it's, you know, I, I positioned the question is, is this a, really a battle between a digital media company and traditional media company? But do you think now you have to operate as a traditional media company, at least when it comes to the production of films? Um, productions of TV shows? No, I don't think so. I mean, I think everything needs to continue in a constant cycle of improvement and reinvention. So the way things were done is the least good reason to keep doing them that way. You just want to do, we want to keep inv innovating on behalf of fans, and how do you make those shows better? How do you make the products work better? It's by getting great creative employees and having them, you know, love where they're working and want to jump out of bed to come to work in the morning. And that's what we have to compete for. And I'm going to give the last word to Jeremy because he knows what all the talent wants to do. It's all about where the talent wants to go at the end of the day. Um, do, you see, do you see a drive towards the, the digital future? Or do you think the digital future is also at, at you know, CBS All Access and all of that? I, I, see, I see a drive towards, you know, for our clients, they want to know that they can go someplace, create compelling content where it'll be marketed and monetized in an effective way. There'll be a transparent relationship with whoever it is they're working with. And I think that's what they want. And the good news is there's a real diversity of appetites on this. You know, it's pretty clear when a client walks in and pitches us a show, it's rare that we go, well, it'd be good for everybody. You know, there's mm -hmm. kind of know what Les wants and he's pretty clear about it, he's pretty good about it. Fox has a bunch of different places, but you know who to go with at what place. And you know, Ted has, Ted's place is wildly diverse. They have a huge, panoply of choices, panoply of choices. But, uh, you know, there's lots of opportunities for clients and, and, and it's a great environment right now for our creators, that's for sure. Great, well, we'll end on that note. Thank you all so much. We really appreciate it and thanks for joining us.